צהריים טובים, שמי אסף אוריון, אני משרת כחוקר בכיר במכון. Good afternoon, my name is Asaf Orion and I'm a senior researcher at the Institute and in the current panel, we will try to discover whether or what lies ahead for the Middle East. In 2011, At the beginning of this decade, the optimists declared, as did the poets, that the Arab Spring has begun, a metaphor which is a little problematic. And now, as we look around at the ruins around us, and I don't want to go into too many explanations, all in all, it looks like a broken landscape, still turbulent. Some of the dust is settling, but the ground is still very much moving and has yet to stop. And so the question is, where are we headed? And of course, there is uncertainty. Tom Friedman suggested from this stage some geometric um, statements. I would worry with geometry in uh, this region because parallel lines can meet if they want to and if in uh, uh, through three dots does a line move even if, it, if as long as it is thick enough and some things happen in Arabic in this part of reality. So instead of being a prophet and saying what lies ahead and what we think about the future, we have chosen another method that is acceptable to the organizers and that is to assume three scenarios for the future and to have them meet with speakers who are representing important players in these scenarios and in this encounter between players, speakers and scenarios we will try to trace a new landscape. Among the players is Dr. Michal Ya'ari, who will represent Saudi Arabia. Michal is a lecturer at Tel Aviv University and in other institutes. Iran will be represented by Dr. Suzanne Maloney, the Deputy Director for Foreign Policy and a Senior Fellow at the Center of Middle East Policy at the Brookings Institute. Uh, background in the uh, uh, in in the Department of uh, State and in Exxon Mobile and in the Council of Foreign Relations. Uh, third will be the Honorable Michel Flournoy, uh, a co-founder and a CEO in the Center for New American Security (CNAS) and previously uh, uh, it. The DOD, the Department of uh, Defense, the National Defense University, and other uh, high government and administration positions. Uh, fourth, and Michel will, will uh, represent the United States. Fourth will be Evgeny Pikunov. Uh, Pikunov. Piskunov, sorry, my apology. Head of the political section. Uh, in the Embassy of Russia in Israel, uh, formerly on various positions uh, in Eritrea and the Middle East and North Africa Department of the MFA of Russia. Uh, after those uh, four distinguished uh, players, actually representing two regional powers and two global powers, uh, we will uh, try uh, to take our responders uh, Ambassador Tzvi Magen from the INSS, Orit Perlov from the INSS, uh, Professor Francois Eidelberg from IISS, Eisburg. Eisburg, sorry. Uh, and uh, last is Professor Itamar Rabinovich, Ambassador, uh, previously our Ambassador to Washington, the, uh, President of the Tel Aviv University and also Vice Chairman of our board in the INSS. Uh, also my uh, professor in the BA. Uh, so to launch our uh, beginning, uh, Dr. Karmit uh, Valenci from the INSS, an expert on hybrid actors and 
from our uh, Syrian uh, program. We'll start with the scenarios. Kamit, please. Good afternoon. We have convened here for this session, not in order to discuss the current trends in the Middle East. The previous panel did so very well. We are here in order to actually leap, a quantum leap ahead in time five years to see the future of the Middle East in 2023. And as part of this exercise, we will try to imagine what this region will look like. For this exercise, I will present three possible scenarios for the future of this region. Presentation, please. Thank you. The first scenario talks about Shiite Iranian supremacy over the Sunni camp, or rather the continued momentum of Iranian Shiites. We saw it already in 2017, 2018. This is actually a scenario that is sort of an exacerbation of the situation of higher intensity, Iran's involvement in the Syrian civil war and the high price it has paid over the years will eventually pay off. In Syria will become a, um, a proxy of Iran, but is also another arena impacting like other arenas such as Lebanon, Iraq, and Yemen. The Iranian dominance has three expressions and manifestations. The first is its ability to assimilate Shiite military organizations in the defense forces in Syria and Lebanon. Another manifestation is that we see Iran The second manifestation is Iran's <laughs> deployment of agents of the revolution which are to disperse and distribute the idea so that there will be Islamiza Islamization of the, era and of the area and we also see the relocation of the Shiite communities into Sunni geographical areas in order to expedite this expansion. As for nuclear, Iran is nearing the end of the agreement and is declaring its purpose to make nuclear for peace and the ballistic missile experiments continue. As for Israel, Iran does not contend with just exacerbating its rhetoric and expanding its friction zone with Israel on the border with Lebanon, the Gaza Strip and Syria. We also are seeing terror attacks with um, some Iranian footprints, uh, fingerprints. Also, it has given some uh, SSM uh, to uh, surface surface missiles to its uh, um, proxies. And so, in the first scenario, we are seeing a Shiite Iranian supremacy over the Sunnis, headed by Iran, and we see the exacerbation of the trend that had begun a few years earlier. The second scenario presents a mirror image of the first scenario, and that is actually the reversal of the trends, meaning that the Sunni, the that Mohammed bin Salman, the Saudi heir, does not content himself with just inner policies, but also makes huge changes in his foreign policy. As part of these changes, he has begun to establish um, ally, new um, pacts, and new, uh, having new allies, and he also invests efforts into the kind of players that are still on the fence, haven't really decided and keep changing their minds frequently between choosing the Sunni and Shiite camps, and we're talking mainly about Turkey and Iraq. The aim, as Mohammed bin Salman sees it, is to create a Sunni unified, strong and impacting area and region 
that takes action to minimize, if not completely, disperse of the Iranian impact in the area using a few steps. One of them is exposing the Iranian undercurrent, the, uh, its terrorist act activities, it issues sanctions on Iran and its proxies, and also provides incentives and carrots, so to speak, for those countries that are on the fence in order to detach them from their dependency on Iran. As for Israel, the Saudis have yet to decide and to have a policy about their relations with Israel. The basis of their dilemma is their desire to deepen the relations vis-a-vis -vis the shared Iranian threat that Saudi Arabia and, Ira and Israel share, and also creating a positive image with the European and Western community. The other side of the coin the, is the antagonism or, or um, potential antagonism from the Arab world with the cooperation with Israel. And the third is the exacerbation of the instability without any real advantage to either party, to either camp, and a lack of indecision. And how did we get there? Well, the Islamic State collapse only increased the competition between the other elements to try and fill the void. The civil war in Syria continues to rage, perhaps not as intensely as it did in previous years, but it is still far from being over and becoming stable. The Saudis, Saudi heirs revolution failed. And we see a Middle East that is much more chaotic, much more violent, much more turbulent and unstable, full of, uh, of, terror, of terror attacks from single people, individuals rather than uh, organizations, and after the collapse of ISIS, and everything that has to do with the inner problems that's also exacerbated the socioeconomic status of the people in the region region has also gone down and one of the reasons for this instability and for the lack of decisiveness by or victory by either party is the fact that the regional superpowers and the global superpowers as both Russia and the United States have stepped down and are not willing to put in any time, money or resources in their region because of its instability and because of the growing uncertainty as for the future of the region. We will now hear how these three scenarios impact the interests and policy of the governments represented by our speakers, the United States, Russia, Iran, Saudi Arabia and Israel. Thank you and let us start play. Start the play. Kamit, thank you very much. The questions are, we'll start from the inner circle and we'll move outwards. First of all, how do these rivals deal, Iran and Saudi Arabia, with the situation? We will ask all the speakers to look at the potential in each scenario and how will they identify it vis a vis their interests, what sort of opportunities, what sort of risks, what sort of derivatives there are to policy making, and finally, derivative from this policy about expectations from Israel. After we hear all four external players, we will ask Mr. Chagai Tzuriel, the Director General of the Ministry for Intelligence, behind whom there are 27 years of service in the Mossad to do the same analysis through the Israeli prison. So we'll begin with Saudi Arabia. Michal, the floor is yours. All the scenarios in seven minutes, and let it be really deep and profound. Must I stand up? No, you must not. Good afternoon. Good day to everyone. A few comments. We as Israelis, and this is especially so in uh, security organizations, that there, we like to say that there are, is a foreign policy and domestic policy are not the same, but they are not two separate continents. They are constantly dialoguing with one another. Sometimes one is more dominant and sometimes the other. But clearly, they are mutually dependent. 
And when we're talking about relations with Iran and Saudi Arabia, we can't just talk about what's happening in Syria or Lebanon, because what's happened in recent weeks in where people in the Middle East are concerned and the competition between, or excuse me, women and uh, uh, women in Iran and women in Saudi, uh, uh, women and who's allowed to enter a sports uh, event. Uh, this is not a local event. It's part uh, uh, this can have direct implications for everything that's uh, happening here. That's regarding the subject of domestic and foreign policy. So we need to learn what's happening on the home front and not only focus on foreign policy. The subject of the nuclear uh, issue was discussed. We often hear the claim that the day when Iran is nuclearized or becomes close to it, then the Saudis will also want to do so. Perhaps theoretically that's really Realistic. But in practical terms, it's very doubtful whether this is can actually be done. Let me explain. First of all, the big question is, is Saudi Arabia willing to bear the sanctions involved in developing nuclear arms? Because that's what will happen the moment it does so. Secondly, who could supply it with the nuclear capabilities? It's claimed that thanks to its, <coughs> its a close relationship with Pakistan, then Pakistan would do it, then Pakistan would bear the sanctions, and the question is if Pakistan is willing to bear the brunt of the sanctions for Saudi Arabia. And then when we're talking about uh, dominance on the part of Sunnis and Shiites or uh, Iranis or Saudis, what are we referring to when we talk about superiority? Are we talking about religious superiority, strategic superiority, political superiority? There are many different categories, each of which needs to be looked at separately. It's very possible that Saudi may obtain strategic superiority, which isn't likely, and on the other hand, is unable to obtain the religious superiority that it so seeks. And so we can't put these two superiorities in the same category and then uh, talk about them uh, as if they're the same. Another thing that I think we need to relate to very seriously is the story with Israel. We tend to think that because of the increase of the Iranian threat and the presence of common enemies, Saudi Arabia is willing to f make its demands of, Saudi of Israel more flexible. And, and Tom Friedman can attest to that. Except we have to distinguish between the willingness to move towards Israel and skipping over the Palestinian issue. The fact that Saudi Arabia is now more flexible toward Israel doesn't mean we can skip over the hurdle that's called the Israeli-Palestinian uh, conflict. Clearly, they each have a clear interest on the strategic level, and the range of possibilities is now almost endless. But Saudi Arabia, as the leader of the Arab and Muslim world, cannot discard the Palestinian issue, although it is like a, 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 a thorn in its eye. Um, the, the Saudi public, the, the fact that the one running the kingdom is now a member of the Y generation, Salman, who is a young, energetic man, and the question is whether he is the right man to lead Saudi Arabia forward. We can argue about that. Saudi Arabia is made up of a population two-thirds of which is under the age of 30. Anyone who thinks that the Saudi population, which is, uh, spends on an average five hours a day on social media, cares that much about the Zionist occupier is mistaken. True, the language is often antagonistic to Israel, but I can tell you based on personal experience, there's quite a lot of contact between young Saudis and young Israelis that in which the word Israel is never even mentioned. Why? Because we have so many other subjects in common that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict can wait on the sidelines. And if there's any room for optimism, that's in the understanding that today it is indeed a new age in which the young people are the ones who are guiding and leading the Middle East. You can look at the leadership not only in the United Emirates or Saudi Arabia or in Europe, there is, we're seeing younger leadership and public opinion is not does not tend towards the 
איפה נמצא הכדור היום? בעיקר הצד הישראלי. יש בעיה קשה מבחינת הסעודים בכל מה שקשור לאמינות הישראלית. עד כמה הישראלים באמת מוכנים להיכנס למשא ומתן? דבר נוסף שצריך להזכיר כאן, עניין המחיר. אנחנו נוטים לדבר במילים גדולות כשאלה. למשל המילה מחיר. Example, לא נדרש מישראל מחיר בלתי price. אפשרי, בוודאי לא בשלבים הראשונים. כשסעודיה מבקשת מישראל להקפיא את ההתנחלויות, היא אפילו לא מדברת על להקפיא את ההתנחלויות לגובה. עם זה אין לה בעיה, אתם רוצים לבנות, תבנו לגובה, רק לא לרוחב. זאת אופציה שהועלתה. זאת אומרת, יש פה בהחלט התקדמות מאוד משמעותית מהצד הסעודי כלפי ישראל. אבל מה צריכה לעשות ישראל? להגיד, אני הולכת איתכם ביחד בנתיב הדיפלומטי, אני ערה לקשיים שלכם כמו שאתם ערים לקשיים שלנו, ובואו נמצא באמת את הנתיב שמפשר בין האינטרסים הישראלים לאינטרסים הסעודים. מתוך הבנה ברורה שיש רגישויות גם לצד הישראלי וגם לצד הסעודי. ברגע שישראל תגלה את הרצינות הראויה, ניתן יהיה למצוא פתרון. אנחנו לא מדברים עכשיו על לפתור את כל בעיות המזרח התיכון, ואולי אפילו את הסוגיה הירושלמית אפשר להשאיר לסוף. כן אפשר ליצור נורמליזציה. יהיה עצוב מאוד אם ישראל וסעודיה יעצרו בנורמליזציה שהיא אך ורק אסטרטגית, משום שהתרומה שישראל תרוויח מנורמליזציה כלכלית עם סעודיה היא בסדר גודל של מיליארדים למשק הישראלי, מיליארדים, ולא נדרש פה ויתור קטסטרופלי מישראל עבור נורמליזציה כלכלית. שערו בנפשכם מה יקרה ביום שבו סעודיה וישראל תוכלנה לצאת פומבים יחסיהן. אני לא אומרת כרגע שצריך להגיע ראש ממשלה ישראלי לביקור בריאד, לא לשם אני מכוונת, אבל אני כן חושבת שיכולים להתרחש תהליכים שבשלב הנוכחים צריכים להתרחש הרחק מעין הציבורית, שביום מן הימים יבשילו לתפאורה פומבית. כאמור לדעתי, פתרון בעיקר בצד הישראלי, כי הגמישות הסעודית היא ללא עוררים הרבה יותר משמעותית ממה שראינו ב-2002. תודה רבה. And what are the policy implications for Iran? Suzanne, please. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I, I note as an American uh, that I found each of the three scenarios to be not terribly optimistic. Um, that may just be my bias uh, coming from a country uh, where we tend to believe that all problems can be fixed. Um, I also found each of the three scenarios not to be wholly mutually exclusive. Um, and in that sense, they represent, I think, hyperbolized versions of the situation that we face on the ground today, which includes uh, aspects of each of these three scenarios, a more assertive Sunni world, uh, an Iran which sees itself on the march and predominant in the region, and uh, the forces of dystopian chaos uh, bubbling up beneath the surface of uh, all of the countries of the Arab and uh, Iranian world. And in that sense, um, I think it's important to recognize that in fact the Islamic Republic can and will adapt to any one of these three scenarios if the region begins to move in either of these directions. And that is fundamentally because there are a set of parameters that guide Iran's regional policies that are somewhat durable um, and enduring in the sense of which they shape Iran's approach to the region and its ability and reactions to, uh, to the context in which it is presented. Um, those three parameters, overwhelming parameters, are ideology, um, both the kind of revolutionary sense of the export of the revolution as well as the um, perennial perception on the part of Iranians that I Iran should be uh, the natural hegemon within the region. That's a sense that dates back well before the revolution but has been expanded by and made more aggressive by the ideology of revolutionary Islamism which came to the fore in 1979 for Ayatollah Khomeini Iran was just the starting point, and of course, the institutions and uh, 
uh, philosophical basis of an Iranian policy which is bent on trying to spread the revolution and to expand Iranian influence have been built into the structure and uh, the, the governing philosophy of the Islamic Republic throughout the past 40 years. The other two parameters that shape Iran's reaction to the region are both its sense of threat and its sense of opportunity. And the threat, of course, is defined as a threat to the survival of the Islamic Republic of Iran, a threat to the survival of the regime that was put in place in 1979. And the sense of opportunity is expansive and uh, variable. Of these three parameters, ideology, threat, and opportunity, two are essentially fixed, uh, at least so long as the current regime remains in place. I don't think we will see a wholesale transformation of the Islamic Republic's ideology so long as Ayatollah Khamenei or some version of Elayat e Farki remains in place. Nor do I think that we have a great deal of uh, ability to impact the threat perception of the Islamic Republic of Iran. This is fundamentally, I think, a lesson that can be taken away from the Obama administration's experience with the Iran nuclear agreement, which didn't really assuage the regime's sense of, uh, of threat or perception that it was somehow less encircled or less at odds with the United States because it does come down to the sense of regime survival rather than a realistic assessment of Iran's, uh, the, the genuine th threats to the national interests of Iran. Uh, and so where we do have the opportunity to affect Iran's regional policy, I think, comes with respect to the context, with respect to the opportunity. And there, obviously, both scenario, scenario one is the one in which we have some capability to see Iran uh, on, a, on a less strong footing, and one in which the United States and its allies, particularly here in Israel, would have a greater uh, sense of, of uh, possibility for constraining, deterring, and even rolling back Iranian influence. But as we talk about the possible scenarios for the way in which the region may evolve and how each of these key actors may respond to those changes, I wanted to at least put, on, put out one or two additional scenarios. And they come down to, as the previous speaker said, the uh, importance of the domestic situations in each of these countries. And we cannot help but have recognized the, the changes that are taking place within Saudi Arabia, within Iran, and elsewhere in the region, and the possibilities they have for impacting the foreign policies of these countries and of the region's evolution. I can't speak to what's happening within Saudi Arabia, although I find it fascinating and somewhat uh, uplifting. But I can say within Iran, what we see, I think, as a result of these protests that have taken place over the course of the past month and the dissatisfaction that preceded them, some recognition that we may be at the end of a road for Iran. Iran, since the revolution, has been in the throes of a competition between the forces of moderation and the forces of extremism. That's why we've seen these varying attempts over the course of the past 40 years to try to reform Iran, whether it was President Rafsanjani's economic reforms, President Khatami's governing reforms, or the Rouhani model of trying to make peace through the nuclear deal with the United States. I think what we now recognize is that reform is not going to be sufficient to meet the demands of the Iranian population, and that puts a, a real uh, dilemma for the Islamic Republic of Iran. And I think it could push the, the regime in one of two directions. The optimistic one is a, an Iran that eventually quietly moves toward a wholesale transformation of the regime or even a full-fledged revolution. The less optimistic scenario is one in which a populist opportunist takes advantage of the grievances that have been manifest over the course of recent weeks through these protests to try to push Iran into an even more militarized uh, and more extremist direction. One of the governing rules of Iranian history is that we are often surprised. One of the other ones is that it can always get worse. So with that, I will leave you and look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Well, this uh, note of optimism takes us directly to Russia, uh, playing the interesting game of the regional powers. Well, how, how do you see those 
uh, scenarios playing out to Russia's interest, to Russia's policy, and some, uh, let's say, advice for Israel. Please. Ladies and gentlemen, as competent experts uh, in international relations, you know a lot about international relations. But one famous politician, of course it's not me, German Chancellor Otto von Bismarck, once said that the secret of politics is to make good treaty with Russia. It was absolutely right for Europe in the 19th century. I'll try to explain you why it is true for the Middle East in the 21st century. <coughs> Frankly speaking, it's not a difficult task to predict my government's actions in the near years. For that, you should simply know the following systemic approach of Russia to this region. First, the fundamental difference between the Soviet Union and Russia. Contrary to the fighter for the communist global order, modern Russia has no ideological disagreements with the West. My nation is also a market economy and vibrant democracy. Thus, Russia is not seeking for confrontation. It wants fair competition and partnership based on pragmatic national interests. Secondly, from our perspective, the transformations in the Middle East are an integral part of today's transitional period in the world. The changes are related to the great shift in global economy leading to a multipolar international system. Due to the unique combination of factors, the current Middle East is just the most painful indicator of the global change. <laughs> However, the nature of this process is pretty much the same. It is turbulence due to uncompromising attempts of some actors to preserve unilateral security and prosperity benefits at the expense of others. Keeping that in mind, Russian policy towards the Middle East is aimed at accomplishing the following objectives. Number one is to neutralize existential threats that could affect Russia. They are international terror groups and proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. In order to eradicate terrorism, we call for unified actions by creating a broad UN-led international coalition as it was proposed by President Putin in 2015. Till that moment, we will strengthen statehood, governments, and security apparatus of those responsible nations which are willing to effectively fight against anti-Russian terrorists. An option of more robust assistance to those governments is maintained too as it took place in Syria amid the rise of ISIS. As for non-conventional weapons, the problem can truly be solved by establishing of a relevant free zone in the region. The GCPOA and full destruction of chemical weapons of the Syrian government have become important achievements. Meanwhile, we have faced a new threat. It is chemical weapons and its production technologies gained by terrorists during conflicts in Libya and Syria. They use it for political provocations against Damascus now, but their focus on Syria will not remain forever because of flexible international nature of terrorism. The second strategic goal is to create environment that would allow Russia's economy and technological capabilities to grow. It is promoted by expansion of bilateral economic ties and coordination on global energy markets. The latter efforts sometimes bring unexpected outcome. For example, a common challenge of volatile oil prices made Russia and Saudi Arabia closer than ever before, leading to the decline of political disagreements. The third objective is to consolidate Russia's position as a center of influence in the world. Among the most important achievements is growth of bilateral multifaceted cooperation with almost all regional nations, including our good friend Israel. <coughs> in addition, Russian military capabilities in the region were improved by establishing permanent naval and air bases. The last but not the least priority is an overall political stabilization in the region. 
It is possible only on the ground of an inclusive collective decision making and the rule of international law. Any unilateral solutions will entail sentiment of deprivation among other actors. This will push them to unilateral actions too. It will lead to cycles of instability. Given this vision, Russia will continue to make a meaningful contribution to settle conflicts in the region. First of all in Syria, where our efforts are aimed at the stimulation of the UN-led political dialogue by Astana and Sochi processes. This should entail an inclusive national agreement among the Syrians. The Israeli-Palestinian problem can also be solved only through direct negotiations and an inclusive international support. As for treatment of the most potentially dangerous Sunni Shia rift, Russia has long been encouraging the Gulf Cooperation Council and Iran to launch a comprehensive dialogue. It should be based on the principle of equal and indivisible security and enjoy support of foreign stakeholders. It is something that Europe successfully achieved about 40 years ago within the Helsinki process. The establishment of a collective security and cooperation system in the Gulf would be an optimal outcome. No doubt the most welcome scenario would be the one which will lead to the emergence of such an inclusive regional system with participation of Israel. It seems that this approach has got a historical chance amid the strengthening multipolar world. The proposed system could be truly efficient and sustainable if it involves new global centers of power. Anyway, I urge you always keep in mind what Bismarck said about Russia. It seems uh, vital amid the growing complexity of international relations, leading to the decline of unilateral conflict management capabilities. An obvious example is Syria. I hope my boring presentation has been useful to you. Finally, dear Israelis, let me congratulate you on the coming 70th anniversary of the revival of your statehood. Love, peace, and prosperity to you all. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, Michel, well, you have now three of the four external, uh, plus the last uh, outline of the main competitor on the peer, almost peer level after China. So how does it look from DC? Well, um, I will say I took my assignment quite literally to project myself forward into the future and imagine being a US policymaker responding to each of these scenarios. So I'm going to take each one in turn and give you a sense of how the U.S. would view the situation overall and then some very concrete practical actions that the U.S. might undertake in the face of each of these scenarios. So starting with the first one, which was uh, continued Iranian Shiite momentum, growing supremacy in the region. I think this is the scenario that would most greatly concern uh, the United States, the existence uh, and growth of the land bridge from Iraq, across uh, Syria um, into Lebanon, plus co presumably continued presence in, in Yemen, that would pose certainly a key, th uh, key threat to the U.S. interests, to our ally Israel, and to our Gulf partners. I think most worrisome in this scenario is the notion of uh, moves to spread the revolution, to actually mobilize Shia populations across the region and even encourage them to relocate into Sunni areas. Um, also of concern, of course, would be any cross-border attacks, uh, terror attacks on Israel and expanded ballistic missile threats to Israel. So what would the U.S., uh, what might the U.S. do in this situation? I think the first thing we would do is look to enhance U.S.-Israel security cooperation to actually counter these advances, both offensive and defensive, asymmetric options, including uh, counterterrorism and cyber cooperation. Um, we'd also probably seek to message Iran's leadership directly as to the specific actions and behaviors that the United States would deem of concern or are unacceptable and to try to articulate specific costs associated with those actions. We'd be seeking to rally the international community to build a stronger sanctions architecture that would generate even more significant pressure on the regime. 
um, and we would be further developing and refining contingency military options uh, to disrupt Iranian delivery of military hardware to its proxies. We'd be also on the diplomatic front, I think, contemplating opening up talks, some kind of diplomatic outreach, perhaps brokered by the US or involving our EU partners to actually seek to have some dialogue with Iran and possibly including Saudi Arabia to reduce tensions. Um, and then of course we'd be um, uh, trying to support people to people and educational exchanges in the region to try to build ties for the farther future among the populations in the region. Um, in, the sec in the case of the second scenario, which is almost the inverse, uh, a much more assertive Sunni camp um, led by MBS in Saudi Arabia, I think in principle the U.S. would uh, support efforts to create a more united Sunni coalition as a means of counterbalancing Iranian influence, but it, there's a big but. The but is it depends on how this would, was done if it was done with or without U.S. coordination and, and engagement, with a collaborative approach versus a heavy-handed approach dictating terms from Riyadh, whether it was part of a carefully coordinated strategy or a series of impulsive, you know, leap before you look kind of actions. Um, so I think, you know, the, again, the question, what would the U.S. concretely do, I think the U. Uh, uh, an administration might consider discouraging MBS from making a renewed foreign policy push in terms of a Sunni versus Shia agenda, uh, in terms of things that would only deepen the tensions along religious lines. Try to focus him more narrowly on specific areas where Iran was directly responsible for creating instability. Um, and also, meanwhile, also uh, seeking to back his uh, reform agenda, assuming that's still going five years from now. Um, I think the U.S. would want to see a reinvigoration of the Gulf security dialogue and or the Israeli consultative group, that kind of contact, um, allowing GCC states, the U.S., Israel, to have, to have deeper discussions um, uh, on steps that could be taken jointly. Uh, uh, to, to counter Iran's destabilizing activities. I think the U.S. would be seeking to find ways to enhance or strengthen its role as a defense ally in the region and as a provider of key partner capabilities. Um, and I think we would also be seeking to promote uh, quiet talks among our allies between Israel and the Gulf states to build confidence and diminish um, any, you know, the taboo against uh, overt cooperation. Um, I'm going to skip over some of this um, just to get time for the last scenario. The last scenario was the one I was tempted to fight. I know we're not supposed to fight the scenarios, but I found it um, very uh, um, disconcerting in the sense that this is the chaotic scenario and the post they, it postulates that the U.S. has completely withdrawn from the region, and that's the part of the, re the scenario I'd like to fight. But I'm not going to fight the scenario. Um, if there was a general withdrawal, I'd still be arguing for maintaining a robust humanitarian commitment, despite other uh, broader disengagement, uh, try to push back against the notion of turning a blind eye to the the region, given how vital our interests are. I'd be encouraging other allies who have interest in the region to, to step in and take more responsibility um, and, I, and support their efforts one step removed. I'd be um, looking at ways to engage, if, you know, if we're not strong on engaging governments, again, engaging populations, what can we do to support economies, uh, people, uh, growing positive trends uh, in, uh, to the extent they exist. Um, I'd be looking to continue to disrupt uh, uh, extremist ideologies and their spread. Uh, I'd be looking to enhance intelligence cooperation, given what the growing mess that is described in this scenario, and also increasing funding to any relevant multilateral institutions that might be able to help. So you can see I took uh, these, each of these scenarios in turn and tried to be as concrete as possible about what a future U.S. administration um, might do. Thank you, Michelle. And right on time, 
חגי, אחרי ששמעת את כל זה, ועם כל ההזדמנויות האלה באוויר, מה זה אומר למדיניות ישראל? אבל במיקרופון. טוב. Okay, I'm going to prove a few things. First of all, that we Israelis are not obedient. Second, as Thomas Friedman said, we are creative. Maybe these are two sides of the same coin. And also to say that in the paper I got beforehand, there was a sentence of escape. It said that if you don't want to do everything that you want, were told to do, you can uh, suggest your own scenario. And the third thing I must comment that as far as I understand, and I'm not kidding um, now, what it says in the scenario already happened. Most of what it says in those scenarios already happened. And therefore, I think that it's not exactly scenario. If we look ahead, I would like, I mean, I'm not going to detail, but it's obvious that Iran already gained from its investment, and it's obvious that it's already using Syria as a logistic uh, uh, home front, and of course it already enhanced its emissary, and the Saudi Arabia um, uh, Air is already an activist in the area. Therefore, I'm not going to detail, but everything that it says in those uh, scenarios already happened. By the way, I'm feeling that this is part of the whole issue. These events anticipate us. I want to offer two master scenarios, um, regional and global in short. Of course, there's no time here to elaborate. Two scenarios that are general. One is a balancing one, and the other one is lack of balancing one. Balance and imbalance. These are my two scenarios. The imbalance, as far as I know, is the present one. This is a scenario which is if more of the same, which is actually a scenario from bad to worse, that uh, in the long time it means that there's a worsening of the strategic situation for Israel. I think we are in this scenario now. 2017 was an imbalance in the area between Iran and the Axis and the pragmatic uh, Sunni camp, and also lack of uh, balance between the Russian dominance in Syria, for sure, and uh, they're still going strong, and the United States. The meaning is, to my mind, that in order to go from uh, the problematic imbalance scenario in which we are now, to the balance one and pay attention. I'm not going to go to a supremacy or decisiveness or prevailing or win. I'm very modest in my expectation. In order to pass from a scenario of imbalance to one of balance, many things have to happen. We have to invest something. And it's obvious that in these things, the actions of Israel will be very important. Uh, the level of cohesiveness of the Sunni camp will be important, and the American involvement in the region in general, in Syria in particular, will have great importance. I am cautious not to allow the Americans and, of course, to the position of Russia, and the, that also will be very important. I'm cautious than giving uh, advice to America regarding their military presence or any other, but I will say that in order that in the balance scenario we'll have a chance to materialize, the Americans have to be involved. They have to be an impactful factor both in Syria and in the political processes that are happening now for arrangement in Syria now and in the future. I'm saying that's important that uh, stopping Iran or to counter Iran, as it says in the strategic papers, this uh, campaign which the administration is uh, committed to, we have to do in Syria as well, in the political as well in other uh, uh, yeah. The strategy of the America with uh, it seems that uh, to date the Americans are continuing to be involved and this for me is very important and let it continue.
Syria was in the last few years the key arena, and it continues to be so today as well, uh, with everything that has to do with the scenario that will materialize. Syria is and will be the key arena because of three reasons, and I'm not going to elaborate, but one is that uh, a lot of relationships and uh, power balances are crossing their uh, juncture, maybe than any other arena in the world. Two, that what happened in Syria and is happening now already had an impact on the entire world, not just the, uh, the it had an impact on the Brexit and the election elections in the States and Germany and Poland, Hungary, and of course it had an impact on the social economical uh, structure in Jordan and Syria is the main link in the Iranian crescent. One side of it is in the Mediterranean, the other in the Red Sea. If Syria is in fact the key arena, then what's happening there is the key. Namely, in England it sounds much better. <laughs> then what happens in Syria is key. And the most important thing that is happening in Syria is uh, the basing of Iran and its emissaries, the militias, and Hezbollah. Syria is a microcosmos and a test case at the same time. Of, uh, what's going to happen there will have a huge impact on the uh, master scenario that will materialize. I will stop here, and if I have another opportunity, I'd like to explain other aspects of uh, the two master scenario, the balance and the imbalance. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hagai. We shall now move on to the responders. Please try to respond. I don't, I don't, yeah, it is. Orit, uh, Okay. So, uh, again, Hagai, we didn't speak before that. But we, we got all the scenarios and I decided, and we, were, we had the freedom to choose something else. So I'm not going to talk about states, uh, not, neither about Iran or uh, Saudi, uh, even though um, I can say two things about Saudi and Egypt. Um, many here talking about the democracy in Egypt and what we're going to see five years from now, but the CC uh, democracy that we're seeing now in Egypt looks more like a monopoly in which all the candidates, candidates are ending up in jail. And in Saudi, they know to do a better uh, marketing strategy. So instead of Thora uh, prison, they ending up, all the billionaires are ending up in uh, the Ritz Hotel. So unlike the uh, Ataturk that we were like hoping here in the Romanticism, when we're talking about the Arab world, uh, they see MBS more as Saddam Hussein and less about the next Ataturk. Um, but I'll say, and another thing, just uh, from public opinion, I'm going to represent the public, uh, the Arab world uh, here, um, regarding the U.S. Um, as compared to, to the Arab world, the U.S. role in the Middle East is ended. Um, not forever, not for good, but maybe for now. And uh, I know people will tell me we still have 2,000 troops in Syria. That's how the population see that. Another uh, very deep sentiment vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. is that the United States is betraying every local uh, ally that it had in the region. And even if it's not true, that's how they see it. And probably it's gonna, uh, we're going to have a trajectory for the next five years. Now I'm going to go for a very bleak vision ahead in the Middle East. Uh, seven years ago, um, we had the Arab Spring, and it started in Tunisia. How many of you know Bouazizi? Just raise your hands. Heard about him? Okay, not a lot of hands. How many of you knows about Faida Hamidi? Well, Faida Hamidi was the policewoman um, who took his stand. She's the oppressor. He's the humiliated uh, vendor who decided seven years ago that life under humili you know, in humiliation is not worth it, and then he decided to burn himself. Uh, seven years later, we have more Bouazizis and more Faida uh, Hamidi in the Middle East. One thing that I can tell you five years ahead, uh, and you know what, before that, 
the young generation, the Y generation that started the Arab Spring, had four trajectories today. One is exiled, the other one is prison, then they have silence because they are being silenced, and the last one is depression. So in five years from now, the Arab population in the Middle East is going to be half a billion humiliated and angry people. And I'm not sure that we are ready for that. So yes, we are in a time when you know, we are ripped for changes, we are ripped for collapse. I'm not optimistic, I have uh, to say. Uh, more thing that we need to know. The average age of the population in the Middle East is 24. The average age of the leadership in the Middle East, 70. Okay, this is unsustainable, guys. This is the, I mean, the penetration for internet and social media is by far the largest one. But when we're talking about the index of democracy and, uh, and freedoms, we are th third place from the bottom. Okay, another thing that we need to know, and I have a minute and a half, uh, look around us and you'll see a lot of destruction. Anybody in this room who believes that in the next five years somebody is going to restruct Raqqa, raise your hand. Nobody. Somebody here in the room think that uh, somebody is going to restruct uh, maybe Mosul? No. Somebody here in the room think that Gaza is going to be restruct? No. Uh, so, uh, so if all three of them are not going to be recycled, and we see the devastation, you know what? You know, we heard that there's seven million refugees from Syria. Anybody in this room thinks that some of them, you know, any date where they're supposed to come back to the region? You know, in Russia, we have a conference now. Maybe they're also supposed to talk about the right of return because there are 70 million of them that's supposed to come back. Uh, yeah, I see this You one. still have uh, 15 seconds to raise the funds. That's it, I guess. Some, we'll continue later on. Uh, maybe the only positive things, the, the paradigms of uh, sectarianism, nationalism, and warmongering are also dying. So maybe that's the optimistic part of what I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Orit. Vika, please. Does it work? Yes. After speaking after Orit is always a challenge. I will also try to be as amusing, but I don't stand much of a chance. What's interesting is the timing. We're holding this discussion in a very interesting timing because while we're amusing ourselves with all sorts of abstract ideas and scenarios, the real practical discussion is now being held in Sochi about the same topics and we don't know what they're talking about and what they have, uh, what outcomes they have come to, so that's why it's so dramatic. Yesterday, an interesting meeting also took place between the Israeli Prime Minister and the President of Russia, and there are some signs, even though we have no findings, that it has been very, very positive and successful. So how does that um, go into our scenarios? Well, we have to see where we have come from, where we are stuck today, in order to try and define where we are trying to get to in these scenarios. In the current situation that we're trying to look for solutions for in Sochi is like the chaos, which I think is quite a moderate uh, definition Russia is attempting uh, to cope with all of these uh, different scenarios. When just over two years ago they have come in order to, they came here in order to promote their own interests, and they found here, aside from a global scene, a global interest this is the main international scene that they have to perform in in order to solve their problems with the United States and the Ukraine and so on. Suddenly they found a wide range of problematic players that they are now looking for so a solution for in Sochi. The first is the locals in. Syria, no one's talking to no one, and, Syria is, and Russia has to find a common denominator for them and lead them somewhere where we're not sure they'll be. And also, no one no, likes anyone uh, when it comes to Syria and uh, Israel. 
And with all these, Russia is uh, having to cope and it has to provide some sort of solution in order to appease them. And that's what we saw yesterday in Moscow with Putin. And this is what we know of that is true with all sorts of... Uh, um, t talks with uh, Turkey and Iran, we don't really always collaborate. They also have their own policy and suddenly they come up with Kurds and all sorts of other challenges that also puts Russia in a reality that perhaps has managed to even surprise it. What would Russia have wanted to gain from such a reality? They would have wanted to maybe get to some sort of arrangement in Syria with the locals, and they have an idea for a federal state, and now with the Kurds we understand what they mean, because without it no one's going to talk to anyone else. But to do that, people oppose that as well, some object to that as well. We see what's been happening recently. It also has to reach understandings ultimately with the other key actors in the area, in and amongst themselves. And when we talk about Iran and Saudi Arabia and Shiites and Sunnis and Israel, it will do the same idea. And as long as they don't reach a common denominator, it is pointless to talk about the arrangement in Syria and perhaps the most probably Problematic. And the final one is understanding the United States. Without them, Russia will have no reason to get out of Syria because that's the main reason it went into Syria in the first place. And the United States is playing a tough game, is being playing hard to get. And it looked like Russia had already won and the United States had left the area with its tail between its legs. Well, now it's being quite effective. And from there on to the scenarios. There are three scenarios. All three are relevant because Russia is able to take any of these scenarios on board because it is prepared for them all. So the Shiite scenario, look what happens with Russia. Russia can speak to Iran. It doesn't like it much, in fact. They have a lot to argue about, and it would rather not see them in Syria at all, and it's quite mutual. But at, at the end of the day, they can deal and cope with the Shiite scenario, unlike most of us. There's also a Sunni scenario where Russia speaks to Saudis and builds nuclear power stations for them and sells weapons to them and has oil transactions with them. And Russians can also talk to Saudis, not to mention Egypt and other such countries. So ultimately, the Sunni Sunni scenario also works for Russia. The third chaotic scenario is probably the one that Russia prefers, because if they cannot reach any understandings with the West, for instance, or if it is unable to find an order, then they would rather be in a region that is in imbalance, because then it has a role to play. And as for Israel, this is my final sentence, at the end of the day, we can manage quite well. In all of these scenarios, Russia is challenging us on the one hand, but also we must remember that it is a strategic asset for Israel, and we must make sure that it remains as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tzvika. Francois, please. Francois. Yeah. Uh, in 2011, I came uh, to the INSS uh, conference, just at the beginning of what was then called the Arab Spring. And all of our all of my Israeli friends uh, gave a rather more uh, cool reception to what was going on in the Arab world. And uh, you know, in the West, uh, in Europe, in, in North America, the Arab Spring was uh, democratic, uh, liberation, and so on. And here in Israel, there was a much more careful assessment. The Israelis were right. Uh, which is another way of saying that it is only with great diffidence that I'm going to attack the scenarios. Uh, but there's a second reason. Uh, there is a reason why I will attack them, and that is they underestimate the level of disruption. Here I completely agree with uh, uh, Chagai uh, uh, Tinel. Uh, these are linear extrapolations. Uh, and we are in a world where Mr. Trump won the American election against all expectations. What do we know about the United States? Nothing. It's a world in which Brexit won in the United Kingdom. What do we know about the United Kingdom? Nothing. A, a completely unknown man with a, no electoral record whatsoever, even as dog catcher, won the election in France, and so on and so forth. Information technology, globalization, climate change, you name it, we are in the era of disruption. So scenarios of revolution in Persia, a scenario of collapse 
in Saudi Arabia, a scenario of war provoked by uh, Saudi Arabia feeling threatened by Iran, fearing the withdrawal of the Americans, uh, and wanting to find a cause around which its unhappy people would be ready to rally. You know, Saudi, uh, Saudi Arabia as Austria-Hungary starts a war. You know, these are things which are a, uh, in the 2023 horizon no less probable than the scenarios which are outlined. So to the scenarios, and here I'll focus only on the third. Uh, uh, the second one, uh, it's a very original scenario. It assumes that Saudi Arabia within five years has become a competent power with an actual state. And, uh, you know, this does strain the imagination. That's where, that's where there is a great leap forward in the scenario. Uh, do I believe it? No, I don't believe it. Uh, so we're in effect left with the third scenario, which is entirely compatible uh, with the first one. And indeed, the first one exacerbates the third one and vice versa. This is what has been happening in the Middle East over the last four years, five years. So it could happen over the next four or five years. Uh, so the third scenario, which is like today, except more so. Uh, the limits of Russian power become clear. America's uh, interest uh, continues on the curve which began in 2011 with the Libya leading from behind episode. Uh, uh, and Europe in all of this. But this is, it gets even worse because you've been focusing, as you naturally do, given that Israel is where it is located, but the broader Middle East also has countries in the Maghreb. The one which I, you know, talking about two key arenas. Uh, 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 Chaga, you're absolutely right, of course, about Syria today. But in 2023, for me, the two key arenas to watch are Saudi on the one hand, and the even larger country of Algeria on the other. More population, more territory than Saudi. And Algiers is about the same distance from Marseille as Marseille is from Paris. As Gilles Kepel put it early on, uh, earlier on, this is a domestic issue. For the Europeans, you know, Syria became domestic in 2015 with the refugees. Algeria, if Algeria goes down the Libya slash Syria road, then Europe will be comprehensively distracted in that direction. And to make that scenario even worse, uh, this is tied to the demographic pressures in West Africa with the roads well, all too well traveled across the Sahara. We have 5,000 French soldiers trying to get some sort of grip, joined by the Germans now, joined by some British, joined by the Italians even. Uh, uh, this could become a much bigger concern uh, than it has been. Will we be able to uh, walk and chew gum at the same time, maintain a presence and a commitment in the Middle East? I don't know, but we'd better increase our defense spending in Europe fast. On that one, President Trump has a point. Thank you. Thank you, Francois. Itamar, please. Uh, thank you. I decided uh, everybody here represented uh, someone or something. I will represent the Middle East. Uh, and uh, I will speak in English in deference to my, my colleagues on the panel and to members of the audience who are not Israeli. What I'd like to do is um, acquire some or offer some perspective. We, we've been speaking about present events, about potential scenarios. You have to remember where we came from. So let me try very, very briefly to point to the four or five main phases that took us from the end of World War II to the present. We began with decolonization, the departure of Britain and France, the establishment of a system of states here, um, the rise of Pan-Arabism. Remember the days when Abdul Nasser was, seemed to be the dominant figure in the Middle East and in Arab countries. People were Arab nationalists or Pan-Arab nationalists, and of course internationally, this was the beginning of the Cold War in the Middle East. In the next decade, the dominant development was the return of Islam. 
uh, Pan-Arabism entered into crisis, particularly in 67, and people turned away from Arabism into Islam. And we know today that if you have a free election in any country in the region, Islamists will win. Uh, this is the dominant trend in identity and, and politics. Third major development, the return of Iran and Turkey. The 20th century, or most of the 20th century, was exceptional in the sense that the two successor states to the Middle Eastern empires, the Ottoman and the Persian, were basically absent from the scene. Turkey was looking at Europe, and Iran was preoccupied with domestic problems and with trying to contend with the Soviet Union. Beginning with 79, with the Islamic Revolution in Iran, and then in the first decade of this century with Erdogan's uh, formation of his first government, Iran and Turkey are back in Middle Eastern politics. Um, this combines with uh, uh, two other important developments. One is the crisis of the Arab world. The Arab world is at a very low point, uh, faces a very deep uh, crisis. Six Arab states meet the definition of failed state, and other Arab states who are not failed face huge challenges and domestic uh, and external uh, problems. And the three most uh, powerful and influential states in the region are not Arab, it's uh, Turkey, Iran, and, and Israel. And this connects to another development, is the decline of the importance of the Arab-Israeli conflict um, in, uh, in the politics uh, of, of the region. The Arab-Israeli conflict has been telescoped into the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It is less important for uh, other, uh, other Arab states. It's not unimportant. It continues to, um, to be potentially disastrous. But uh, if you compare the significance of the Arab-Israeli conflicts to the region today, to let's say what it was in 1967 and late 60s, you can see the huge difference. And we have discussed aspects of this in t earlier today, earlier in, in this panel, the previous panel, and, and throughout, uh, throughout the day. What, uh, what we have now is a, is a very confused mixed picture that described by the scenarios and by actually the previous panel and uh, my predecessors in, uh, uh, in this panel. In addition to the crisis of the Arab world, the U.S. pivot, let's call it uh, gently, um, the def definitely diminishing American profile in the region. Of course, Russian um, uh, activism and the mixed Arab-Israeli uh, picture uh, creates this uh, confused uh, reality that, that we, are all, uh, we are all facing. So uh, what does it mean and where does it take us? I, I joined the, the pessimists. We've used the terms disruption We've used um, instability or Im, uh, imbalance, and I'm afraid that if we look at the next few years, we'll see more of that. Primarily because of some of the issues that Orit uh, discussed, uh, uh, discussed before, I, I would say to uh, most of you, I don't think it's been specified, Orit is the person who monitors the social media for the, uh, for the INSS and has her ear to the ground on what goes on. Uh, so first of all, demography. You mentioned uh, already the fact that there will be half a, mil half a billion Arabs in, uh, in a few years. Egypt just became a country of 100 million. And uh, there is a huge discrepancy between demography and resources. In, in countries like Egypt cannot feed their own population. Um, there is no way that uh, countries like Egypt and other countries in the region will be able to accommodate these young individuals who graduate uh, high school and university and want to go into the labor market and, and find uh, employment, housing, and so forth and so forth. The Middle East is not in a position to, to do that, and therefore instability will continue. This is uh, fertile ground for Islamists and other uh, radical movements. This is a cause for immigration or emigration out of the region and into Europe. Not, you don't need necessarily an acute crisis uh, to, um, uh, to, create, uh, to create that. Uh, of course, uh, the lower American profile in the, uh, uh, in the region and uh, 
Soviet new activism and the beginnings of Chinese uh, diplomatic military interest. Bear in mind, China now has a base in Djibouti, not so far from the region, and China is becoming interested in uh, the Israeli-Palestinian issue, is becoming interested in, in Gaza, and I suspect that five and ten years from now we'll see a much higher uh, Chinese profile in the region than, uh, than we see today. So if we add all of this up and we look at the three scenarios that we uh, were presented with, unfortunately I have to go for the third. Thank you. תודה, איתמר. יש לנו זמן למשפטי סיום. אז פיינל, פיינל סטייטמנטס, before we close. מישל, would you like to have uh, a go or a pass? Oh, um, or a deferral? Oh. Which... את מוותרת על זכותך? רק משהו קטן. Just a small thing. People usually eulogize uh, Saudi Arabia. I don't eulogize, but I don't think it's going to continue in the current constellation. I just offer one thing. When we just, uh, when we judge the, uh, the king of Saudi Arabia, let's judge it according to our measures, because we usually criticize his country in much more severe ways than we do with our countries. And let's remember that this man Salman has been in office just for two years to test uh, success or failure of policy in two years. It's really, uh, uh, all in all, the guy just came out, you know, all his reform was a year ago. It's not the right thing to do, really. Thank you. Suzanne, you'd like to have a go? Suzanne? Sure. Um, well, first lesson learned is don't follow the assignment <laughs> and restrict yourself to responding to the scenarios. But I do want to underscore some really important things that other people said. One is this sort of inexorable march of very fundamental things like demographics, um, like um, climate change, as, as Tom has reminded us of politically, but things that will really strain this region of the world, no matter how smart our collective policies are. Um, second is I firmly agree with Francois's um, notion that I think the more, most, the more likely and consequential cases are far more disruptive than the sort of linear projections that we were asked to discuss. Uh, and I think those, in, we want to make sure that we, we are thinking about some of those, planning for some of those, for some of those and also trying very hard to prevent um, things like an open war between Iran and Saudi Arabia, or the collapse of, you know, the violent collapse of a Sunni regime, uh, and so forth. Um, and I just want to underscore that I, I couldn't agree more with the concerns that have been expressed by everyone here about the risk of diminished U.S. engagement in the region, um, despite the rhetorical change that we've heard, we have not actually seen a real shift in policy, and I don't think, I haven't seen um, the administration's strategy for how the U.S. intends to engage, re-engage, lead in the region in a way that's, you know, clear or compelling. So I would just, as an American, I would just say I share uh, the concern that's been expressed here. Thank you, Michel. Francois? Yeah, I, I would add that a, uh, if we assume a, a high degree of probability of great disruption, uh, the policies we have to think about are those which can meet, a, uh, which we would need to implement whatever the outcome. And from a European and an American standpoint, I think that would mean uh, that uh, we should maintain our military presence as well as our political engagement, notably in the Gulf, where we do have military assets currently arrayed, uh, that the end of the war against the caliphate should not uh, uh, provoke the closing down of these bases and facilities, which are not inconsiderable, including from the European uh, uh, standpoint, and countries in the region uh, should gently pressure us not to withdraw. Secondly, uh, and, and maybe a bit more surprisingly, 
I would argue it would actually be quite useful to keep the Russians uh, in Syria. Uh, not because I have any particular love for what they have been doing, uh, but because uh, they uh, will necessarily cramp Iran's style in Syria one way or another. I think it, 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 uh, uh, they will represent a complicating factor for whatever projects uh, the Iranians uh, uh, may, uh, may have. A recommendation also, uh, if disruption is the risk and the kind of war which I mentioned earlier on, the Austria-Hungary scenario, uh, that really calls for a high degree of carefulness in the implementation of policy. I'm not simply thinking in terms of you know, defining policy, but in terms of policy execution. And carefulness has not been the hallmark of a, uh, what has been done in the region by many outsiders, whether it's the invasion of Iraq uh, uh, in 2003, uh, or, a, or in some cases the non-intervention uh, as it was in 2013 when we had the red line uh, uh, crisis. And the very last point on China, I entirely agree with Itamar. Uh, I don't think it's a five-year issue, though. I think it's a 10 to 15-year issue when the Chinese are going to start to venture uh, as a great power, as, an, as a direct actor, not simply as an interested party uh, in the region. And the more direct a implication uh, will be, of course, that this more powerful global China uh, will uh, attract America's and Europe's attention more than has been the case until now, in including in terms of allocation of resources, which will therefore not necessarily be free for operations in the Middle East. Thank you. Suzanne? <laughs> Thank you all. I thought this was just a fascinating discussion, and I'm so glad for the opportunity to hear the differing points of views. Um, and I think we all come down to a probably relatively pessimistic view of, of where the region is today and where it might be in another five years. I think the prospect of moving from imbalance to balance, as you suggested, needs to be the kind of joint strategic vision of the United States, Israel, and all of our allies, both tacit and explicit. Um, but I also believe that to accomplish this, to essentially to set back what appears to be the kind of first scenario of uh, Iranian momentum is going to require a certain degree of disruption um, to the current balance or the current imbalance to get to effectively a balance of power between a Sunni world and a Shia world between Iran and its primary regional adversaries is going to require um, taking on Iran in a way that where its advantages lie. And Iran is most capable of pushing back um, where there is uh, disruption. They can exploit divisions, they take advantage of chaos, and so all of these negative trajectories that, that were posed by some of the other panelists, I think are tailor-made for the Iranians to in fact expand their position. And a U.S. which is not just sort of retreating from the region, but appears to have um, uh, almost a lack of, of a uh, clear understanding of the trends and the dimensions of what's happening in the Sunni world, of what's happening in Saudi Arabia in particular, uh, I think is quite dangerous because we're going to be less capable of providing the kind of uh, pathway from imbalance to balance in a way that will in fact set the Iranians back rather than give them a more advantaged position. Thank you, Suzanne. Chagai? Yes. Um, is it working? Yes. First of all, following what you said, which, which of course was very important, I want to say the balance-imbalance uh, scenarios, which are, in my opinion, uh, sort of master scenarios, which uh, sort of catch all scenarios, uh, don't only deal with uh, the uh, balance or imbalance between Iran and the Axis or the, or the uh, um, Saudis and, and the pragmatic camp. It's not only about that. I didn't get to it, but I want to point out that it also includes the balance or imbalance between publics and regimes, which is a huge mega trend that affects everything in the world, not only in the Middle East, between states and non-state actors, but not the ones we were talking about until today. I'm talking multinationals, not violent necessarily non-state actors, and between local and global forces. So, but that, those are things that I didn't have enough time to speak about. 
Now I will summarize what I, my point is. Bottom line, there are two scenarios, balance or imbalance. We are in the imbalance scenario. It is bad. It will take serious doing in order to move us from the imbalance to the balance. The United States and Russia will have a major role in deciding which way we go. And as far as the region is concerned, the outcome in Syria will be very, very important in deciding which of the master scenarios will actually be realized. Thank you. Thank you. As a representative of the scenario, I feel a duty to relate to the criticism. And of course, the answer is that these uh, scenarios were a priori problematic in order to see if you're all aware and awake and to enable you to come with creative solutions. But joking apart, as for content, I don't agree with the statement that the scenario are a mirror image of the reality at the moment. I think they um, represent and an exacerbation, especially the one with the Shiite dominance. To say that today Syria, the way it is, is an Iranian protege, I think it's a little bit uh, deviates from reality. And you can, uh, I'm not going to elaborate just now because just in uh, two words, also the tension that we see of what's happening there, even the tension vis-a-vis -vis the Syrian regime, Assad uh, doesn't take uh, dictate uh, for the Iran, uh, Iranian uh, wish to base there, and also the tension vis-a-vis -vis Russia. I think that this uh, tension is going to deepen as time goes by, and that the military campaign will end, then we will see uh, to, to go back to the natural character of Syria, and also the local population. We see they do not accept the Iranian presence. There's uh, uh, opposition there, objections, so I think what we described in the scenario I do not accept at the moment, and I'll stop here. Thank you, Karmit. First of all, I'd like to thank the participants of the panel, each of uh, them for the contribution and the angle. This meeting was uh, filled with uncertainty. So first of all, let's uh, try co to construct some sort of a future. And you see that there are many possibilities. Also, you get this variety of approaches, how people approach a problem. Some people dealt with politics, others uh, uh, thought of non-politics, of uh, bottom-up, uh, uh, faith, uh, the structure of the system. Also, we had cultural approaches. Am I obedient? Um, do I comply? Do I work? according to orders, am I a methodical, uh, an 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 mystic, or who are you to tell me what kind of reality there's going to be? I'll determine what to analyze, and I also have a simple answer. The situation is complicated, and it's either balanced or not balanced. Okay, we have a 100% probability this way. I don't give uh, marks here. The issue is not criticism, but the variety of approaches, professional, both to how we imagine the future. How do we analyze the future? Is it similar to the reality we live in or not similar? And also, what kind of examples and values are we basing ourselves when we analyze? Just notice this Western tendency to see if it's not balanced, it's not good. You know, balance in Syria now for six years, who <laughs> let it not finish ever, but it did. There was a balance there of in, a, a, a war that doesn't end and uh, games of forces. You cannot just sit on the top of the mountain and just look at it. That wasn't our problem directly, but this is good time now that the stress of the analysis is that these times are over, finished, and now the, there's a one trend uh, we don't want the friction, but we don't want the bad guys to win. And so when we look at the history, and some people here said, 
China in the Middle East is coming soon. There are periods in the Chinese history, 1,700 states, and then it becomes six, and then it became three, and then it became one, and then again it's going to dismantle and disintegrate. So our expectation that the history is going to uh, one way, it's not real, there's a big river there, you cannot hold it forever, and it will always surprise us. I think today we looked into the lab of how you think about the future, how you look at the past, how you try to draw conclusions, and uh, we actually realize that we don't have a clue how it's going to be, but we have to keep thinking about it.